Okay, so welcome back to everybody. So the next speaker will be Michael Loss, and he's going to talk about decay of entropy and the cut master equation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, thank Guido and also Francesco, who is not here, for organizing this wonderful event. This is really a wonder, wonderful in institution. And of course, I also would like to thank the, for inviting me. Otherwise, I would not have been able to come to this wonderful institution. And now, I would like to talk a little bit about the few things which you know about this Katz master equation. And most of these things are learned from Eric Carlin and Maria Cavallo, who were part of the scientific organizers and who cannot, unfortunately, be here. So many of the things, virtually all of the stuff which I'm going to tell you, I somehow learned from these two people. So what, so the Katz master equation. So notice I, I pointed out here, sim, I put simple in italics, I want to emphasize it. It's, it's really an extremely simple model. And what is supposedly describing, it, it describes collisions of n monoatomic <coughs> gas particles. And of course, you know, this is a very, very difficult problem. So what you do is you, you cut it down to something which is tractable. Uh, so we're going to, the, the, the worst, the, the, the toughest assumption which you're going to make is that we're talking about a spatially homogeneous situation. In other words, I'm not talking about the variable density. The density is constant, and, and, and I don't see the position of the gas particles. I only see the velocities. Moreover, we will talk about the mean field description. So what is mean field? Mean field means that a gas particle collides with every other part, a gas particle more or less at the same rate, right? It's not that I, we distinguish that, so I say, nearest neighbor gas particles, gas particles which are close by collide. But of course, this doesn't make any sense. After all, we talk about a spatially homogeneous situation. Uh, now, of course, we can also talk about this system. Particles move in three dimensions but the notations would get extremely clumsy and cumbersome, so we're going to do with cuts, assume that the particles only move in one dimension. And as soon as you do that, then you have an interesting conundrum a little bit, because you would like to conserve energy, and you would like to conserve momentum. But when you have particles colliding in one dimension, you cannot really, I mean, Yes, so what does it mean? When the energy is conserved and the momentum is conserved, either the particles go through each other, in other words, they keep their velocities, or they exchange them. And you know, not much interesting stuff can go on. Okay? So this is, so what we then decide is we will conserve energy and we do not care about the momentum. Now, the state of the system is therefore, uh, at any time t is therefore specified by a probability distribution f, which depends on these coordinates of these uh, this velocities of these particles, v1 up to vn, and of course in time t. And for net notational convenience, I will write this vector here abbreviated as v with an arrow on top. Yeah? So, now, this, these are sort of the basic assumptions which we're going to make. Now, what is the model? Well, I'm writing here something down. So what do we do? We, we take randomly a pair ij. And randomly, we, I mean uniformly. In other words, uh, the probability of a particle i and j is always propor uh, uh, proportional to 1 divided by n choose 2. Okay? And then what do we do? These two particles with label i and j, they will collide. And how do they collide? Well, what we do is we, we, we pick randomly a scattering angle. And the probability distribution here is, is rho of theta. So rho of theta d theta is the probability with which we pick the scattering angle. And then we do something on the surface of it quite silly. Well, we update the velocities, name it these are the velocities before the scattering. These are the velocities after the scattering. And you, as you notice, is, this is just a rotation, right? Okay. It's, in other words, it's a random rotation. 
And why do we do that? Of course, because this makes evident that the kinetic energy is preserved. The sum of the vi star squared plus vj star squared is the sum of the vi squared plus vj squared, right? So that's what we do. Again, we pick a pair randomly, ij, distinct indices. These two particles, ij, will co uh, collide. We pick randomly a scattering angle with this probability distribution. We update the velocities by a rotation. And if you like, uh, you notice, by the way, I haven't said anything about time yet. I will talk about that later. So in this way, by repeating this in a random fashion, what you get is a random walk. We call it the cat's walk. OK? So let's start deriving some formulas about this. So here, as I said, the energy is conserved, right? This is my total energy. I call it E. And in probability, all you can do in some sense is compute expectation values. So let's assume that phi, yeah, by the way, I should say, you see, the, the v squared is equals e. So let's take a function phi, which goes from the sphere in n minus, in n, in, sorry, it's a sphere in n dimension, but it's an n minus one dimensional sphere with radius squared of e. So a function on the sphere into the reals. Okay? So now, what do we mean by an expectation value? So here, what are we interested in? We are interested in the following. Suppose you know that the particles have velocity v, and now they go on, undergo a collision. So in other words, I'm interested that given that at the jth collision, that's the jth collision, the velocity is given by v, what is the expectation value of phi of the j plus first collision? Right? And what is that? That's given by this operator qn applied to phi. And what is that? Well, I define rij, which means what? I average over the rotation angle, the scattering angle. That's what I do here. Then I average over all pairs, and I divide by n choose 2. I mean, that's the average over all pairs. Okay. So that's what this qn phi is. Good. So with that, we can actually produce what is called a Markov transition operator. Again, let's take the phi to be an arbitrary real test function on the sphere. Now what I would like to do is, I would like to take the probability distribution on, after one collision. You see, what I would like to cook up is a process which is an evolution on probability distributions. So let's take F1 to be the probability distribution of these particles after the first collision, say. I don't know what it is, right? So what do I do? I can say, well, this is certainly the expectation value given that before the collision, the velocity is equals to v, averaged over the probability distribution which I get was initially given before the collisions. So that's this thing here. Now, we know what this is. I just defined it before. That's just qn applied to phi, integrated against f0 v. And now, this is a linear operator. This linear operator can move over by taking the adjoint. And you see, this is true for, for any real test function. So therefore, I conclude that the f1 is even given qn star f0, right? So this is the way how the probability distributions progress. Notice here, I said here qn star. And let's go back to this q. What was it? This was this gadget here. Now notice, if I reverse the rotation, right? make the inverse rotation, I would just replace theta by minus theta, right? And when I assume that rho of theta is a symmetric function, for example, you have seen this in um, Logan Devillet's talk, that the scattering cross-section was always a symmetric function of the scattering angle, and in some sense that's what this theta is, of course much more primitive. 
So if you assume that this row of theta is a symmetric function, then you see easily that this Qn is a self-adjoint operator. Right? Because when you do the adjoint, what you have to do, you have to undo the rotations. In other words, you have to pass to the in inverses. But since the distribution is the same, it's self-adjoint. Okay? So that's kind of useful. So you see, this operator is going to be the main object of study. And the way you should think about it is this. You take in Rn planes, right? Two-dimensional planes. What you do is you average over rotations in these planes. You average then over all these planes. That's your operator, OK? Now, this operator can actually, it's, it's actually complicated, despite the fact that it looks so simple. So, well, it's very easy to see, well, easy. I mean, of course, it's always easy. Uh, the, this operator has actually discrete spectrum. How do you see that? Well, you know that this operator is generated by rotations, right? So now you know another operator which commutes with rotations, that's the Laplacian. So therefore, the Laplacian operator commutes on the sphere, the Laplace Petrami, commutes with that operator. So therefore, you know that the space of spherical harmonics is left invariant by this operator. And since these are finite dimensional spaces, you know right away that you, in each of these invariant subspaces of finite dimension, you have discrete spectrum, right? That's easy. So you say right away, if you want to understand this operator, it's easy. All you have to do is screw around with spherical harmonics, right? Turns out to be. Well, spherical harmonics are huge, right? There are lots of them. And these spaces of spherical harmonics of certain fixed degree can get very, very large. So this is not an entirely trivial operator to analyze. Anyway, let's go on again. So this is uh, this, this microscopic reversibility. That's what it's called. This guarantees that this operator is self-adjoint. OK? Good. So, therefore, what do we do? Well, if you want to compute the probability distribution of the k collisions, what you do? You start out with, or, with your originally probability distribution, and you apply this operator k times. That's what it is. OK? Good. So now, let's talk about time. So far, I haven't done anything. So we assume that the times are distributed according to a Poisson process. And we assume that. It's that, that the, the, the ti is the first collision time for particle i. In other words, what it means is that before the probability that before time t there was no collision decays like e to the minus gamma t. That's an assumption. And gamma is just a constant to make this thing sort of dimensionless. It's in fact, what it will be is it's the mean collision time between two particles. Now, if you have, and now you see, when you have the particle i, this particle i can, com, can collide with any one of the other n minus 1 particles. And what we therefore do is we look at, the, as, look at the probability that the minimum of this n collision times for each particle is bigger than t. And we assume that these collisions are independent. So therefore, it's an exercise to show that this probability is just a product which is just the nth power of that number, OK? So these are our assumptions. It's a little bit of probability, but not a big deal, I think. Good. And now we put these all things together. So what is the probability distribution at time t after k collisions? Well, that's this gadget here, which you recognize this is precisely the Poisson factor, right? And then finally, what is the probability distribution at time t after arbitrary many collisions? All you have to do, you have to sum these things up. That's what you do here. And you see, everything works out quite beautifully. Namely, what is this? This is just the exponential of this matrix up here. I mean, I shouldn't say matrix. I mean, I have to apologize. For me, operators are always matrices. I hope you don't mind. So. So we have this, this, this matrix up there, OK? 
So, so what, is, what is then the story about the CATS model? The CATS model is just the study of this time evolution. And you notice, uh, yeah, by the way, we said gamma equals one. That's simply a choice of time unit. And the whole story is just starting this operator, which looks actually exceedingly simple. Okay? So in some sense, what you can do now is you could, in principle, forget everything, what I've told you so far, and just concentrate on that. That's where all the mathematics is. Okay? So, now, microscopic reversibility allows you to look at this operator on a Hilbert space, and this Hilbert space I denote by L2 of the sphere with sigma n. Now, what is this measure here, sigma n? Sigma n is just the uniform probability measure on the sphere. I would like to normalize it, yeah? That makes things very convenient, okay? And then uh, we also fix the energy. Why do we call it, make the energy equals to n? That's very reasonable because we assume that per particle on average we have an energy of unit one, right? Makes, it's, it's reasonable. Okay, so therefore, what you have is now, you have this operator on this space, L2, and yeah, and all you have to do is to study this. And let me just mention, I know this is extremely primitive. We could have done a little bit more. We could, for example, do three-dimensional collisions, as I explained it here. So, yeah, I forgot to say. Let, let, me, let me go back here to this, to this expression. Fix a particle i. Hmm? Now, when you think about how many other particles are around with which this particle can collide, well, there are n minus 1 particles around. So when you take the rate of collision, the rate of collision of a particle i with any other one of the others is 2. I mean, 2 is not important, but what is important is it's independent of n. And this is known as what is called the grad limit in the Boltzmann equation. If you want to derive the Boltzmann equation, you have to assure that the rate of collision is kept constant as n goes to infinity. And that involves a certain limiting procedure. And I also adopt the same procedure here. Of course, here it's much more elementary. Now, the next observation, of course, is obvious the evolution is linear. And you admit to me, it's nowadays very rare to have anything interesting to say about the linear evolution. We will see. Thirdly, we can generalize this thing to momentum-preserving collisions in R3. How do we do this? I think you have learned this from Laurent de Villette. Here is the collision law, right? Omega is a vector in S2. These are your pre-collisional velocities, vi and vj. These are the post-collisional velocities, vi star, vj star. I mean, I think long choose prime, iu star. I hope you don't mind, OK? And, and then what is the rij? The rij can be written as the integral of s2. This is the scattering cross-section, if you like. And then you stick in here your, your test function, phi. OK? In principle, you can do that. And I will mention later some important work by Stefan Michler and Clement Muho, who actually analyzed such kind of problems uh, in detail. But this is very, this, you see, if you would like to have a realistic scattering cross section like hard spheres, this would be proportional to vi minus vj magnitude. I, I don't want to consider this. This is much too difficult for me. Uh, Stefan is the expert on this business, right? Okay? So I keep it primitive, one-dimensional, uh, rho of theta. Where is it? Here. A nice function, take it smooth, whatever. And however, take it symmetric, okay? So these are these remarks which I wanted to make here. So, a little summary here. We look at this evolution. F0 is your initial condition. We can take it in L1. That would be desirable. After all, it's a probability distribution. This is your 
power series, if you like. You can write it this way. This is the master equation according to Katz. And the RIJ I've written here once more. Qn star equals Qn. And here is the collision law. So this uh, little slide uh, summarizes all what, is, what there is in mathematics about this model. Okay? Nothing more, nothing less. Good. So, now why consider such a simple linear model? So the first question which you can ask yourself is, well, what happens actually in the limit when n gets large? You see, I think, Stefan, you would agree with me, the Boltzmann equation has not really been derived in a satisfactory way, right? And what do I mean by derived? Derived in the sense of deriving, deriving the Boltzmann equation from a Hamiltonian many-body system. There's this work by Landford. There's also some beautiful work of Illner and Pulverenti. But these things only work for very, very small times. I mean, Pulverenti is different. The point is, these are works because we have to control the collisions and you have to make sure that you have only very few collisions. That's what always the assumption is behind. So we don't really know much how to derive it. But I would like to explain then eventually that you actually can derive from this simple model an equation which looks like a Boltzmann equation. Now you can say, well, this is not really satisfactory. After all, it's, it should be Hamiltonian mechanics. That's the fundamental thing. But at least we will convince ourselves that based on this simple model, with very sound probabilistic assumptions, you can derive for large n an effective equation which looks like the Boltzmann equation. Uh, important will be here the, no, the, the notion of propagation of chaos. That's an extremely important notion nowadays. I mean, when you look, for example, at this work of Yao, Erdős, Schlein on, on the gross Pitayevsky limit, it's all about propagation of chaos to show such kind of things. And you will, this, this is actually where this whole story started with Katz. Katz was the first who really wrote down in a precise way what we mean by propagation of chaos. And he didn't call it chaos, he called it the Boltzmann property. Okay? We will come to that. Now, the other thing which you can study in this model is approach to equilibrium. Right? This is a kind of a mystery, the equilibrium. We would all sort of agree that this room is more or less an equilibrium. Although, so it's one of these things which we would like to talk about, but we don't really know what it means in the real world. <clears throat> but here, in this connection, we know what it means, we will talk about it. And also, what we would like to do is we would like to find quantitative rates of approach to equilibrium. How fast do you converge to equilibrium? And there's various things which you can do. You can use the notion of a gap, and you can also use the notion of the entropy, and that's going to be somehow the main part of my lecture series. OK, so let's look a little, a little bit closer. Let's try to understand, in quotation, the Boltzmann equation. So how would we do that? So we take our time-evolved state. It starts with some f0. And what we do is we multiply by a test function of a single variable. Of course, that you can then write simply by integrating out all the other variables over the sphere as the marginal here times phi integrated from minus square root of n to plus square root of n. That's obvious, right? Because think of it as a sphere, right? You integrate, you, you fix one variable, v1, and integrate over all the others. Now the v1, remember the sum of the vi squares must add up to n. So you have integrated over all the others, so the, 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 the variable which is left over just runs between minus square root of n and plus square root of n. That's it. Likewise, you can take a function of R2 into R, and you integrate now to figure out the two particle marginals. That's given by this formula. And you integrate, of course, about v and, uh, here over V and W, V squared plus W squared less or equals N. OK? So now here's a little computation which you can do. It's a very simple computation. Namely, you calculate the derivative of this 
And what you get is this complicated, well, it's not so complicated. It's, it's this formula. It's very easy to do. There's absolutely no problem with that. Okay? Namely, what you have to do is simply plug in, the der the, take the derivative here, plug in the formula for the time evolution, do all the integrals nicely, and that's what you get. By the way, I forgot to say, the f for me is always a symmetric function in the velocities, right? Because after all, it doesn't really make sense to distinguish the particles. Okay? So this should always be a symmetric function. I forgot to say that. Okay. So now, you see, this derivative here turns out to be this compl well, complicated, this expression here. And you notice here you have the two-particle marginal. Now, if you knew that f and 2 of v and w would be a product, approximately. Then you would say that this f and 1, this one particle marginal, would satisfy this equation, which is kind of a Boltzmann type equation, but of course in this context. Okay? But of course, it's not really true that that this holds, which just doesn't. And this is where the, no, the notion of propagation of chaos comes in. So we talk about a sequence of probability distributions Fn of v. How should you think about them? You see, this is now a sequence of probability distributions where the number of variables starts growing. So the first element is a function only of one variable. The next element in the sequence is a function of two variables, three variables, and so on. Okay? So the n runs now from 1 to infinity, capital N. Okay. Now we say that this sequence of probability distributions are chaotic if this limit here, namely what you do, you take your fn of v, okay, which depends on n variables, you multiply by a product of such test functions, phi is a function of one variable only, it is product, and you take the limit as n goes to infinity. First of all, the assumption is that this limit actually exists. And moreover, you call the sequence chaotic if this limit here is just where you integrate your fn of v over one single function, you integrate it, and then you raise it to the power k. Okay? So what this is saying, in some sense, is this tells you that this sequence of probability distributions are asymptotically, if you like, independent. You see, you have two little difficulties here. Uh, you don't really find any independent probability distribution on the sphere, right? Why? For the simple reason that the sum of the vi squares have to add up to n. So it's never going to be independent. The other difficulty will, you will have is that the Katz evolution really doesn't respect independence, should there be independence. Anyway, so here is your definition, okay? So asymptotically, you should think of this fn of v. When n goes to infinity, it looks more and more like an infinite product function. Huh? But that's, of course, very loose. Now, remember, I assumed that these limits all exist. So therefore, what we're assuming here is that when I integrate out the S of all variables except the first one, that this integral is given by a function f, and this function we'll call the limiting one-particle marginal. Okay? So that's the notion of chaos. Right? Is there a question to that? So this is an important notion. Hmm? So, now, what's the point? Uh, well, let's get to an example. Let's take the integral over the sphere of the constant function. And I take the product of this phi of vj. So now, what you do? You start integrating over your sphere. So we integrate over all j's equals k plus 1 up to n 
over all these Vj's squared, so that this is equals n minus the sum of the Vi squared, but i runs from 1 up to k. Those you guys you fix, right? Agreed? And then you have the function 1, and then you have to integrate this over d sigma. Now, what is the dimension of this sphere? You have lost, that's an n minus 1 minus k. You integrate over that. And you know what you usually get? This is a gadget of the following type, n minus the sum of the vi squared, i equals 1 up to k. And then you have a power here, which is roughly this one. Okay? Something like that should come up. Okay, it's, it's one of these integrals which you have to do uh, over the angles. And then you have also a factor here, which is Sn minus k minus 1, the surface area. Okay? Now remember, what you then do is you multiply by the product of these phi j, vj's, and then you integrate over the rest. And then what you also have to do is you have to divide this by 1 over Sn minus 1, square root of n, the surface area. So you have to divide this by the surface area. And now, you see, unless I screwed it up, presumably I forgot some ends here. Yeah, sorry. So this, this, this is a sphere with this radius. So anyway, when you, when you pull out the n, if you have done it right, you should, this n should scale out. And what you see is an expression which, as n tends to infinity, just goes to a Gaussian. This is one of these instructive computations, and I guess I forgot divided by 2. Okay? That's what comes out. This is a, a computation which is known, I don't know, goes back to the ancients. I mean, uh, Maxwell knew it. Boltzmann, of course, Poincaré, all these people. And the French call it, I think, the Poincaré limit. Is this correct? I think so. I mean, that's what I learned from Dominique Bacri. Okay? So here is this computation which you can do. And you see, this is quite nice, right? Because the Gaussian really nicely factorizes. And you see that you get just this integral over r phi of v times the single Gaussian to the power k. Okay? So here's an example. Good. So, now here is the theorem, which goes back to Mark Katz. This was the first of its kind. And what I also would like to mention is a paper by McKean from 1965. And I tried to give you a little bit of a sketch of a proof of this propagation of chaos in the spirit of Henry McKean. So what does it say? You start out with a chaotic a uh, sequence of probability distributions. Huh? So this is this gadget here. And remember, what does it mean? Roughly, it means that asymptotically for large n, this probability distribution sort of factorizes into this product of limiting marginals. Then, now what you do? You take this, this, this probability distribution and you evolve it under the Katz master equation. You get this function here. And what it turns out is that this function is also chaotic, and its limiting distribution, should say, oh no, limiting one particle marginal f of vt satisfies the Katz-Boltzmann equation, which I've written here. Note this here. This is the limiting marginal of your initial condition, and this is the limiting marginal of your evolved state. Okay? So, so in some sense, this is an extremely clever way of solving the Boltzmann equation, right? Namely, what would you have to do? I mean, if you could do that, right? You start out with your initial condition. You try to construct a sequence of, one, of, of um, uh, probability distributions in n variables so that these guys are chaotic with this limiting marginal. Then you take this probability distribution and you evolve it. 
Then you pass to the limiting marginal, and sure enough, you get the solution of this differential equation, uh, this, this inter integral differential equation. Okay? Uh, it's, it's kind of, this, this is kind of clever. Huh? So this is what Katz proved in 1956. And he also made a sort of a, 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 a I don't know, a cheeky remark by saying, you, you see, it's because of this theorem. You see, the time evolution here is totally trivial. It's linear. Everybody knows how to do that. And he said, therefore, to worry about the existence of a solution of, a non of such a nonlinear equation is not very interesting, right? That's what he says. All right. So what I would like to do, so that everybody understands the theorem, right? So you start out with a chaotic sequence. You fix your time t. You evolve this chaotic sequence. You get another sequence. This sequence turns out to be again chaotic. And it's one particle marginal satisfies the katz boltzmann equation. Okay? So uh, let me try to give you a sketch of a proof. Now, I, I was wondering, maybe it's, it's better to do this on the board because things go usually too much too fast. So what do you have to do? Maybe, maybe I'll do it, uh, make a few steps here. So you see, the first step you would say is, is I mean, this is a difficult gadget, right? Because this is your uh, Fn at time t, which is an evolution applied to your chaotic state. So of course, it's very natural that you, you put the evolution on the other side, which you can do. You just have to think of this function as a function really on the sphere s n minus 1. You can do that. So you push it over. Here it is. And now you have to sort of show that as n goes to infinity, this whole gadget deteriorates into a kth power of something if the phi is a, a, a tensor product of functions of single variable. That's what you have to do, OK? And it looks a little bit uh, difficult. Well, here, of course, you could involve, invoke the, the, the product structure because you know that when n gets large, this sort of factorizes, right? But you see, what is the problem? The problem is here that this function has more and more variables, right? Because what does this qn do? It, yes, it, it, this, this phi has only k variables, but this qn applied to the lth power to the phi produces more and more variables. So these variables grow. And then you have to cons uh, uh, control that. And that's maybe not so easy. So let me make a definition first. Gamma phi of b1 up to vk plus 1 is given by this gadget here. So what do we do? We take the phi and pick each vj. And what do I do? I do a scattering with an imaginary particle plus one. Oops. I lost this one. Thank you. I was wondering that it sounded like my steps and not my voice. Is it okay? Yeah. All right. So that's what you do, right? So, so this, this is just a sum j less or equals k. And what you do, you add on one variable, minus phi. OK? So, so now, remember, I always assume that these things are symmetric. So now look, when you do this, and you, you integrate of all these variables, these additional variables, you can replace this guy by this guy here. And what is this one? It's just this gadget here. All right, so this looks complicated. But it really isn't. Because all I have done, you see, for each, when, when it, let, let me write this down. When I take n times qn minus the identity applied to phi, 
what do I do? I get 2 divided by n minus 1, and then I have a sum i less than j, and then I have the rij applied to phi minus phi. I can write it this way, right? So let's think for a second. You see, the i's here, they can run over all the variables which I have in here already. The j's can also run over all the variables which I have in here already, but there could be, there are of course, many more, right? I mean, k is fixed, n is huge, 10 to the 26. So there are lots of additional variables. But you see, since I'm assuming that these functions are all symmetric, I can clean things up in the following sense that I can say, well, what do I do? I first take the sum only over i less than j less or equals k, right? That's what I'm doing here. This is just one piece where the i and j are just run between 1 and k. And then I stick the other ones all together into this gamma. And since, you see, it doesn't really matter when I have j equals 50,000, say k is 5. I have j equals 50,000, this variable gives me the exact same contribu contribution as if I take j equals 49,000 or whatever. You agree? Because of symmetry. It doesn't really matter how I call these variables. So therefore, you can actually simplify this whole expression here and write it in this fashion so that you get that this g is just this number here and the gamma. Remember, what does the gamma do? It adds one more variable. But then, of course, you have to have lots of those gammas, namely n minus k divided by n minus 1. OK? That's what you get. I mean, this is a step which follows exactly like what Katz was doing. OK? All right. So now, you need a little lemma. The lemma says that when you take g applied to phi, you take the L-infinity norm, that's less than 4k times the L-infinity norm of phi, the gamma likewise, and the difference of the two actually is 6k squared divided by n minus 1. So in other words, this difference here goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Now, this is certainly not a big mirror. So first of all, the gamma estimate is a total triviality. You agree? Why do we see that? Here's the gamma. I take the L-infinity norm, what do I get? Well, I get twice times k. And those guys, the minus sign I ignore, I just take the L-infinity norm of those guys, gives me another 2. And then I have the integral of d theta, the rho theta, that gives me 1. Okay? That's easy. You have to work a little bit more for the g. Well, you just do it, right? You get 2 over n minus 1. Here you get an n choose 2, uh, a k choose 2 times 2, plus this guy times 4k. You believe me that you can add these numbers up, and you get this 4k. Finally, when you take the difference of g and gamma, you see that you get here n minus k over n minus 1 minus 1. Now that, of course, goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Here, you're in very good shape because these terms are just 2 times k choose 2 divided by n minus 1. This is perfect, goes also to 0. So you certainly can believe me these three estimates. They're very elementary. OK? I mean, I've written it out here for a moment so that, I mean, these slides are eventually on the web, I think. And so all the details are there. OK? So this is completely elementary. Now, lemma 2. This is a little bit less elementary, I mean, conceptual. You see, you have a function which has k variables, 1 up to k, uh, k uh, certainly less than n. And now you would like to understand something about the powers of g and the powers of gamma and the difference of the powers of, gamma, of, of g and gamma. Okay? So how can you deal with it? Now, you see, this is a, yes, this is immediately obvious, right? Why? You see, when you apply the g to phi, what happens? You get a new function which has now an additional variable. So the first estimate gives you a k times 4. Now, when you apply the, the g again, since you have an additional variable, you get another 4 times k plus 1. 
the additional variable, you get another k plus 2 times 4, and so on. So you do this L times, that's what you get. And now you see, the bad news is, these things now start growing in L. The next thing is, the gamma to the power L, you do exactly the same, it's completely elementary, right? The last one. The last one you see, this is not so clean, right? I'm saying there exists a constant C such that this is equal, bounded by that. And I should put here the L infinity norm of phi. So why? Let's just do it because it's pretty straightforward. So you take this usual telescoping series, right? I mean, what else? And now you notice that when you take the L infinity norm, what you have to do, you, you have to sum up these L infinity norms. And now again, remember, what do these gammas and this G do? They add variables. So what you do is, you get from this guy here, from this guy, you get this product. From this guy, you get that product. And the beauty is that you have this G minus gamma, which sticks this guy in between. Right? It's not a big deal. And now that sum you can clean up, and what you get is this estimate, this, this formula here. And now you have to figure out how big can that stuff get. Well, k plus l minus 1 factorial, let me divide this by l factorial. And then you use uh, uh, Sterling's formula. Is it i or e? I never know. Do you know? Sterling? I mean, maybe I've written, uh, uh, read too many of the, much of the Financial Times because there's the pound Sterling. And what we mean is Sterling. So I think it's an I here. Okay? Sorry about that. Okay. So here is, so, so you use Sterling's formula. Here I've applied it, k plus l minus 1 to this funny power, e to the minus k minus l minus 1, etc. And now you see what happens is you can factor out this l, and what you, what you see, most of it cancels out. You have an l to the k minus 1 here. Now this gadget, as l tends to infinity, produces a precisely an e to the k minus 1, which kills this e. So you learn, certainly know that this gadget is roughly is, is, is less than the constant times L to the K minus 1. That's obvious. OK? So far, you agree, it's all very elementary. And now, finally, remember, you have to sum in here. This sum, of course, only grows like L squared, which actually proves this estimate here. Remember, I divide it by L factor, so I have to multiply it back. OK? So. So these are just straightforward forward elementary lemmas, but let's just see what this gets us. Uh, as a corollary, right, when you now sum this up, what you get? Well, you see, this is the, the, the L factorial in this estimate which we had. Where was it? Cancels out. You have an L to the K plus 1, but you have also this exponential factor 4 to the L. Now, that you have to beat, and that's the reason why you have to assume that T is less than a quarter. And when you do that, you see that this is less than the constant times 1 minus 4 T K plus 1, this gadget. Main point, this goes to 0 as N goes to infinity. Good. And now comes an observation of McKean, who pointed out that this gamma is a derivation. Namely, what does it mean when you take your functions v1, phi of v1 up to vk times psi of vk plus 1 to vm, and you apply the gamma to it, that's the same as first applying the gamma to phi, there should be a phi here, sorry, times psi plus phi times gamma of psi. That's kind of a very nice observation. And now I think we are ready to put things together. All right. So you fix the time less than quarter, right? I mean, after all, these sums should be finite. This, this so remember, this is the gadget which we are interested in. So what is phi? Phi tends to k simply means it's 5v1, 5v2 up to 5vk. 
So, <clears throat> so this is the limit which we would like to compute, and we want to see whether this limit here can be written as the limit of a kth power of this fn of v integrated against a single phi. Hmm? That's what it means, propagation of chaos. So, now what do we do? Well, remember what we did. We pushed the time evolution over to this phi tensor k. Now, our lab has actually showed uh, that the first, the first remarks showed that this evolution on this phi tensor k can be written in terms of the g to the power l times the sum. What we also learned is that in the limit, as L n goes to infinity, this g to the l you can replace by gamma to the l. Very good. And now I use the fact that f n zero of v is actually a chaotic sequence. And remember, what do, therefore, what is this? This is an integral from r to the k plus l. Remember, this is a function of how many variables? It's a function of k plus l variables. All right? So therefore, what we get in the limit as n goes to infinity, r to the k plus l, f tensor k plus the k plus l fold tensor product of f with itself, and then the gamma l on phi k times tensor with itself. And then I integrate d k plus l. And you notice, you see, when the l runs, these spaces get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? But that's just what the way it is. Okay, and this uses really heavily now that the initial condition was chaotic. All right. So now we have to massage this last term. And here's this observation of McKean. Now we can use the fact that this gamma L, gamma is a derivative, a, a derivation, I should say. So what does this mean? See, this is the gadget which we're interested in. So because gamma is a derivation, you can actually write this in the following way. You see, the gamma, you can write as gamma to the L1 times gamma L2, gamma LK, and here you put in this combinatorial factor, and then you sum L1 plus, plus LK equals L, right? That's because it's a derivation. This is just a, a, the, the Leibniz rule which apply here. Nothing else, okay? All right. This is good. But now what we do is we can split this stuff up, right? The L I can write as a sum of the L, L1 up to LK. I do that. And then what do I get? I get F tensor 1 plus L1, gamma L1 phi. Then, you know, F tensor 1 plus L2, gamma L2 phi, and so on, right? And up to, up to the last one. And you see, what you notice is that this integral now factors into integrals of this type. And that's all because gamma is a derivation. I think this was a very nice observation of McKean. Makes the thing, I think, you see, when you read cuts, it's not so transparent. This is, makes it much more transparent. Okay? Very good. And now, this whole sum is actually, of course, now nothing but this sum to the power k. Just like when you show that the product of exponentials is actually the exponential of the sum, right? Okay, and now you see what we have done so far, I can actually reverse the steps. Namely, this gadget, of course, is nothing but the limit as n goes to infinity of that gadget to the power k. And here is a single particle function, okay? So, what does this show? This shows propagation of chaos. So therefore, what we can now show, let me go back to this formula which I had at the very beginning. Here. You see, when you take chaotic initial data, it's actually fairly straightforward to show that these limits as n goes to infinity of Fn, Fn1 actually exists. And when your initial condition is a chaotic, then you know that this limit here is actually really the true product of these two limits here. That's what propagation of chaos is all about. So therefore, 
we have proved this, this theorem here, right? Proved was a sketch, right? I would have to show that these limits exist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but that's, that's straightforward. Okay, so now let me remind you again what is nice about this. It exists to an existence theorem for the Katz-Boltzmann equation. In fact, you can show, that's what McKean did, that the Katz-Boltzmann equation, the solution, if it exists, is actually unique. This is the existence part. You also notice, by the way, when you take any given f in L1, you can certainly find a chaotic sequence with f as its limiting marginal. Just write this down here. It's a little bit... I mean, it's not entirely trivial. You see, it's nicely normalized on the sphere, yeah? Uh, that is actually chaotic, needs a little bit of work, but this can be done. It's not really a big deal. So what do we do? We solve the master... We, we, we start out with our limiting marginal. We write down this Fn0, which is chaotic. We solve the Katz master equation with this initial condition. The f and t is chaotic with limiting marginal f t. This guy satisfies the Boltzmann equation. Okay. All right. So this is a, a rough outline why we are interested in this. You have this linear equation in high dimensions. You have the equ effective equation, the Boltzmann equation, in low dimension, however nonlinear, and this whole field, in some sense, lives off this back and forth between these two pictures, okay? And so the plan of my, my course is, next time, to study more closely the approach to equilibrium. There, is, there are several avenues. One is through the gap of the operator. That's uh, very successful, except, as I will try to point out to you at the end, it's totally useless. This usually happens. You work very hard, right? You get something done, and you're happy. And then you really stare at this, and then you find out it's actually totally useless. Okay? But anyway. So I'm not going to prove anything because it's totally useless, but I'll just show it to you. Now, there's the other approach, which uses entropy, and that's the main part of, this, of my course. It turns out, in the context of the Katz model, this has not been very successful either, but it leads to some interesting mathematics, and this kind of mathematics will be important for later, which I'm going to show you some successes to. Okay? All right? So bear with me the next few hours. The next hour is maybe a little bit not so successful, but I hope that the other three hours are better. Okay? Thank you for your attention. <laughs>